This conference will now be recorded. All right, so we're going to start um, talking about population ecology today and uh, move as far through the lecture as we can. And hopefully I can get this so I can't see myself. All right, terrific. All right, you might hear some sound in the background. I'm at a shared office space. All right, so populations, what does that mean? Well, populations of organisms mean we're talking about the same species. So we're either talking about the same species of green snake, or we're talking about the same species of birds, say um, uh, sparrows, or we're talking about the same species of trees, say lodgepole pines, right? They may exist with a bunch of other different things, like the pines exist with the birds and snakes, but the population that we are considering from a theoretical or thought perspective is going to be whatever species we define, and it's gonna be one species. And it's bounded by an area. Here's where science gets a little fuzzy, but also allows for a lot of, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Specificity. All right, so we could explore the snakes in a population, this particular population of green snakes uh, that exist within a one acre area of forest. Or we might be exploring, say, bird behavior in a single block or in a single city. Right. So those, those are bounded areas that are um, arbitrary in the sense that we could explore the bird, this bird species all over the globe, or we can reduce our questions or hypotheses and predictions um, down to a smaller area like a city block or a city uh, in order to understand whatever it is we're asking or trying to learn about that species. The habitat within which a species is found, like this snake, is going to include the quality of all the resources that that snake needs to thrive and reproduce and for its generation its next generation of offspring to also thrive and reproduce. All right, so those resources are a place to hang out. So you could think of that like a, a home, a um, place to hang out and sleep. It could be places to uh, perch in order to uh, get your insect food if you're these birds, or it could be the soil resources and the air quality and how much light you get in terms of the tree. And if we think about bacteria, which are, you know, quite numerous across the globe, it might even, we might even be able to think about the area within which the bacteria are delimited as a single human body, right? All of the gut bacteria and all of the beneficial bacteria in the skin, what is the quality of the resources that are provided to that bacteria based on that human's diet, the pH of their skin, that kind of thing. All right, so population ecology, we're gonna be talking about populations, how they need resources, and how with sufficient resources, populations can grow. And how populations grow, they grow by reproduction. Or they can grow by um, movement of individuals from one population to another. And we call those source and sink populations. Population growth is a function of resources and interactions between individuals and interactions with the outside world. And of course, we know that populations can go extinct. That doesn't mean necessarily that the species goes, species goes extinct, but it can become extinct in a particular area. So one of the things that we think about in terms of population's health, because remember here, the habitat is defined by the quality of the resources. And at increased densities of a population, the number of individuals per unit area or volume, if we're talking about bacteria, then those resources are going to become um, fewer and potentially of a lower quality. So as the number of individuals increase in a defined space or area, typically the resources in their habitat are gonna decline in either quantity or quality, all right? So for example, here we have in the early um, development of uh, cities in the United States, and this was true pretty much throughout the developing world, uh, we were, um, had limited resources because of technology, technological limits, in terms of access to cooling off in hot summer months, all right? So 
one of the ways that this population would cool off is to um, hang out in the water uh, and use these street water resources as a way to basically cool off, especially for the poor. And that could lead actually to increased disease depending upon the density of the population. In a small town that's using the same resource of water to cool off, you might expect lower disease frequency than you would in a um, city that's uh, more congested with people and has potentially lower low infrastructure like poor sewer quality. Or you could expect the inverse and find that a small town because it doesn't have the money for sewer infrastructure, is actually going to provide lower resources. I mean, how do we measure density? Well, we measure density by sampling. We cannot measure every single uh, sparrow species on the planet or every single human being and every green snake's response to a particular habitat type. So we have to subsample and extrapolate that doesn't mean that we're going to come up with error, but it also means that we're probably not going to come up with something perfect. And that's one of the beautiful things about science is that it continues to build upon the knowledge of previous generations and also can expand its knowledge through the use of technology as well as social innovation. Social innovation is basically learning how to understand cultural exchange as a habitat or a habitat component and a resource for humans' ability to perceive the world more objectively rather than subjectively. All right, so sampling. We count a subsample of species. So maybe um, you've heard about some of the research done in Central Park or in the city of Seattle on crows and how those researchers have learned simply by observing initially that crows it looked like could create tools, which we thought was only something only capable uh, from higher level, quote unquote level, uh, more complex brain systems, right? Then after making these observations, observations about the crows, they started to do what is called mark and recapture. And that's where you might um, capture the crow and label it. Maybe you paint one wing pink or you put a little uh, um, circlet on its one of its legs and then you can observe that animal repeatedly to see if its behavior is distinctly different from another animal that you've captured. Or if you're trying to figure out what the density is of a declining population of snakes, for example, then you might mark as many snakes as you can find in a a particular habitat that you've defined the area of, right? So maybe you have um, 15 acres and you mark every snake you can find of the species that you're interested in, in that 15 acres and then you come back a year later and you see how many of those marks that you capture, recapture, and then you come back five years later and 10 years later. And then you have a lot of data to see if the population is increasing in size or decreasing in size. And so this is a way that we can estimate population size based on the number recaptured and also allows us to, through marking them, to compare how individuals might differ in their use of resources and their response to each other as well as other components of the, their community. All right, so how do population size change? Well, we know that through reproduction, we can get an increase in population size. So births are going to tend to lead to an increase in population size. Immigration from another population is also going to increase population size. What will decrease population size? Well, emigration, moving out of that population, as well as death. Dispersion. Dispersion is the pattern of spacing among individuals. And there are three major um, types of dispersion or pattern of spacing. Okay, so individuals could be clumped or aggregated into patches. So if you think about that ant um, that, um, let's say you, your child dropped a po uh, popsicle on the ground and you go for a walk and you come back from that walk and you see a ton of <laughs> ants around and on that popsicle, right? That is gonna be a clumped distribution of those individuals. That's gonna be temporally limited because it's a response to that resource. 
Um, and so that's another thing to remember, this pattern that we're going to see oftentimes of spacing is going to be a response to resources. Some organisms are more mobile, like ants. Others are less mobile. So plants, you will often find um, in clumped, uniform, or uniform uh, dispersive patterns. For example, there is a plant called creosote bush. Creosote bush is in the Sonoran and other desert types, and it produces a chemistry that basically kills other things that try to grow around it. So it's competing for limited nutrients in the soil and limited water resources. It's growing in the desert. And those desert soils are typically poorly developed because they don't go through a lot of weathering. They don't go through a lot of seasonal change. And of course, they're going to be exposed to a lot of drought. And so when you have this chemistry, let's say around this plant's roots, um, just leaking out to say, uh-uh, you're not growing here, no way, then what you see especially we can get a picture from above or high up on a peak, is this very uniform distribution of creosote bush across like a creosote flat. Um, it's very cool, actually. Uh, territoriality in animals can regulate dispersion and can lead to evenly spaced, say, birds who are very territorial often, or a lot of lizards are territorial. So you might get a uniform spacing because they each need a, a particular area within which to um, attract a mate and have babies. And then rampant, random means that there's an absence of strong attraction or aversion among individuals. So you don't have individuals that are clumped together like honeybees or ants going after a resource because numbers actually can be a way to defend themselves um, from predators, nor do you have an evenly displaced because of aversion to each other. So this is a clumped pattern. So these guys are not um, expressing aversion, but actually they're clumping together because in this nice clumped formation, they are going to be better protected from birds that want to feed on them. The birds might take out a few, but they're not likely to take out all of them before some of these can drop off when the bird is attacking. So we can have intrinsic or sort of internal drivers that lead to individuals clumping or being uniform or etc or we can have extrinsic drivers now which do you think would be the driving force for these individuals clumping would this be an intrinsic force that leads to them clumping or an extrin extrinsic woo extrinsic force all right so another example to think about play with in your brain um, if you have a lot of, um, let's see, that would be extrinsic. I'm trying to think of an intrinsic force. That's the challenging. All right, so what about bacteria? Let's say you've got bacteria and um, they are found, this particular species of bacteria or strain of bacteria is found only in the upper intestines of mammals. It's never found in the lower intestines of mammals. Whereas another species is found throughout the, in, the intestinal tract of mammals. Which one of those would be potentially extrin, extrinsic or intrinsic? And I just want you to think about that. All right, so this is an example of that creosote platter I was talking about. So as you can see, these creosotes are really uniformly distributed throughout the landscape. There are a few plants that have evolutionarily developed an ability to deal with the allelochemistry allelo uh, that the creosotes um, exhibit. Same is true for walnut trees. Okay, now we're going to start thinking about um, how we would look at graphs of individuals to determine whether or not they are distributed in one of the three patterns we've explored. So we're going to remember here that the axis are the number of individuals based on the geographic location. Okay, so it's going to be the number of individuals in response to the geographic location. So the x-axis is which and the number of individuals is on which axis? All right. All right, so random. Again, here we have random distribution of ferns in a forest. Um, what would a graph of a random distribution look like? 
So I want you to draw this in your notebooks and keep for future reference, okay? And then if you have any questions about it, contact me. And if you're so inspired, draw a graph also for a uniform distribution. And what was the third one? We had uniform, we had clumped, and we had random. So let's see what your graphs look like with the X and Y axis cross um, labeled properly. So the axes have to be labeled properly for you guys to get credit. And I want your best guess of what they would look like, those distributions based on those three distribution types. This is not the only points that you're going to lose are if you do not label the axes correctly and title your graphs. Otherwise, um, you're going to have to make something look really foolish to lose points for just um, doing the thought experiment of what, of what the graph would look like. All right, because that's really what we're doing. We're just exploring with our brains. All right, so what makes a habitat suitable? All right, so the quality of the habitat is going to limit the distribution of the organisms. So quality of resources in that habitat are one thing that are gonna define the suitability of that habitat. And I don't want you to think of suitability as a zero one or yes, suitable, not suitable. It can be a continuum. So you can have somewhat suitable, incredibly suitable, poorly suitable. So this is a continuum of quality or qualifications um, or qualitative assessment, sorry, not qualifications, qualitative assessment of habitat components. So what are some of the basic resources that are necessary for individual species to survive? And this is another thing to think about. Are we considering the suitable ha habitat as defined as surviving or that species thriving? And remember, from evolutionary biology and an ecological sp perspective, individuals thrive based on reproducing and their next generation also being able to reproduce, all right? So fitness in evolution and ecology is defined as the individual is able to pass its genes on to the next generation and that generation can also pass those genes on. So if you choose to not have any children, you have a fitness of zero. Does that say anything about your humanity, your value to the world, your intellect? No. It just says from an evolutionary perspective, you have a fitness of zero. Your genes, you are not passing your genes on to the next generation, which could actually be a gift that you're giving to the larger community if habitat resources are going down because population density is too high. So a lot of the terms that we use in biology, ecology, and these sciences will, in common parlance are very weighted. They have, a, they have a, an ethical or moral tie to them. You know, we tend to have perspectives about them. We tend to have belief systems and emotional reactions. But in ecology and biology, it's not an emotional reaction. It's just quality and quantity. All right. How might resource availability and distribution alter a species distribution and density? All right. So we've got here a little bunny rabbit and a bunny rabbit that has been bred to be quite large. So would you expect resource availability and distribution to differ as a result of a p exploring a population of average size bunnies versus a population of giant bunnies? So what kind of suitable habitats, um, what characteristics do suitable habitats have? Remember, a habitat is defined as resources that are available to that organism to survive and reproduce. So for trees, for a maple tree or any tree, it, that habitat is defined by the soil resources, the amount of rainfall, and the amount of UV exposure, as well as how many predators that they're going to encounter or disease, which can be a consequence of rainfall <clears throat> or soil quality. Whereas for starlings, um, what might define a suitable habitat for starlings? They're gregarious. So they don't um, exhibit aversion to each other. They're not like many other birds that are territorial. Uh, so crows can be very territorial. Uh, catbirds can be very territorial. 
but starlings, they tend to aggregate, and you guys have probably seen them flying in the evening sky in large groups. And they will hang out in trees during the, when the sun is setting and just sounds like they're like, I don't know, like having a nightly chorus or it's a jam session at night, the starling jam session. Anyway, they are gregarious. They like being together. So space, how is space going to be defined differently as an important habitat quality for a starling versus another bird species that has an aversion to this kind of density because it wants to protect its territory and isolate itself and its mate and its offspring throughout that um, reproductive season. Uh, another thing to think about before I go farther, starlings uh, are European um, bird originally. <clears throat> they have now quite a large distribution in the US. They're found everywhere. So what would be the characteristics that would be necessary for the starlings to be able to settle in the US location? So they were introduced by a, a naturalist enthusiast um, who loved the bird song. And so he brought them over from England. But he and many others brought a lot of other bird species over and they did not become these ever present ubiquitous birds in our skies and in our trees in the US. So why is it or what sort of quality characteristics in the habitat or quantitative characteristics would have allowed these starlings or perhaps something about them to basically become so widely distributed while another bird might not be able to? All right. So to climate change, because climate change is an ecological driver because it changes habitat quality by changing the resources, the quality of the resources, as well as the quantity of the resources available to organisms. And we are seeing this as we see different organisms moving towards the poles and out of the warming centers. And they spent not all of them, but a lot of them. Okay, so the warmer winters on average are actually moving maple tree distributions farther north. Okay, so people who were um, harvesting maple syrup in this part of the country uh, can look at by the time we get to 2.5 or 3 degrees Celsius, and we're on our way to 4 degrees Celsius at this point, um, there will either no longer be maple trees at 4 degrees Celsius, so goodbye maple syrup, or if we can stop at somewhere around 1.5, you might get a little bit of loss of uh, maple syrup making here. If we go to three, you're gonna see that maple syrup's not being made here and it's moved up entirely into um, Canada. So since 2000, we've had a 0.4 C increase in average annual temperatures. Um, we are above 1.0, I think we're at 1.2 now. And it's projected to increase by three to seven degrees by 2030. All right, so that is a lot. This is not something we hear in the news. It's too bad we don't hear it in the news um, because I think there's a lot of creative people and people who are passionate about nature and conservation. Conservation um, Hunters are often passionate about nature, gardeners, naturalists, scientists, children, families. So if this information had been more available in the news, perhaps we would be better prepared for what's happening now. But you can think about how climate change and warmer winters on average, which is critical, drier summers on average, how some places are going to be have more rainfall and more frequent hurricanes. What's going, what is going to happen to the habitat quality, not just for the different species that we might be interested in animals, but also for the human species? All right, thinking about habitat and population distributions a little bit more with a nuthatch example. So if you live in the US, you've probably seen the nuthatch. They're all over the place. Um, in some of these uh, hotter areas, you're gonna find them typically in higher elevations. They prefer broad shaped leaves to build their nest with. Uh, they feed on insects and meaty seeds. Okay, so they've gotta have some place that's got broad leaf trees, that's got plenty of insects around. That beak is perfect for insect eating and getting out from between moss or from between um, sections of bark. 
and it's also able to feed on some of the larger meteor seeds. Meteor meaning not necessarily with a hard seed coat, but with a you know a large soft reward on the inside. They're able to store and hide food in the lichen on trees. A lot of times people look at trees that have a bunch of green or blue green patches on them and they'll think it's a disease and that's actually lichen. And that's a great place for insects to hide out and also for these beautiful nuthatch birds to hide their food. They prefer mature forests, and that's a result of these different characteristics about how a habitat is defined for them as a good, healthy habitat that they can thrive in. So if we are losing mature forests at a rapid rate, which we are, then what is likely to happen to the habitat range and the population distribution of these nut hatches. So for example, uh, if you live in some of these inner eastern states, they're experiencing a huge population explosion because people are moving from the fires in California and the flooding along the Gulf Coast inland. Um, and uh, housing prices and um, land prices were really low. So for these people up here, uh, who are also experiencing incredible increases in uh, values of homes, these people who are losing their homes due to flooding, and these people who have lost their homes due to fire, this is a really attractive place to move. But if you have like a 20% increase in population in a year, that means you're going to have a massive amount of houses um, put in, uh, or apartments. And typically when developers put in housing, they just clear cut the trees instead of what they did in the 1950s and 60s, which was to select a few mature trees to save in a neighborhood. Um, mature trees typically increase the value of a home. Now they just clear cut those trees. And so we're losing mature trees and having um, cities and uh, new developments dominated by saplings. Not an ideal situation for the nuthatch. All right, so thinking about the ocean. So scallops and seagrass. So we, there was a research that was found that scallop densities were lower in patchy seagrass habitats compared to continuous seagrass habitats. So if they had a really nice, big, big patch of seagrass, then the um, scallops were doing great. But in it started to thin their forest of seagrass, you think of it like a forest, started to thin, then that habitat has become less advantageous to survival and breeding of scallops. What you can do, this is a really interesting um, interaction between uh, multiple organisms that affect a key organism we're interested in, scallops in this case, is population uh, distribution. So if you Google scallops and seagrass, or scallop loss and seagrass, you're going to be able to find that story. If you have any trouble finding the story, then please contact me. All right, so populations need resources, and with sufficient resources, populations grow. That growth is a function of resources and interactions, and populations can go extinct. All right, so um, let's just introduce the null hypothesis at this time and forget about the free distribution. So null hypothesis. Um, a null hypothesis is what provides us a guiding line or a guiding concept to make sure that we're being as objective as possible as scientists or biologists exploring um, our questions and trying to get the answers to those questions. It provides an expectation based on our understanding of how things work, okay, which could be limited, could be wrong. Um, and we test against the null because it is basically the idea that nothing changes. So if we want to know why, um, uh, let's see, I keep thinking of human examples and I don't want to just leave it at human. All right, so let's say that uh, we are curious as to why Lyme disease is increasing in deer populations and the northeastern forests. We are going to use a null hypothesis, which is often a hypothesis of no change, as a way to keep us uh, grounded in our experimentation. 
So our null hypothesis that there is no change, there will be no change in Lyme disease populations in deer if we are hypothesizing that it's because tick populations have increased, then we can say that tick populations are not the cause of Lyme disease increases in deer, for example. So we're gonna test against that null, right? That null is our guiding line. And so we could say our alternative hypothesis, we could have hypothesis one, hypothesis two. Hypothesis one is that ticks are increasing, and as a result of ticks, increasing, there's increased Lyme um, presence in uh, deer populations in uh, northeastern U.S. Or we could have an alternative pop, uh, population hypothesis, and that is, is that deer populations are increasing in the northeast, and because of that, tick populations are increasing, and so is Lyme. We need our models to be simple, right? So these are very simple models. We're not considering weather. We're not considering um, a lot of different factors we could be considering like food quality for uh, the blood quality and food quality for ticks. We have to keep it simple because human limitations, one, we can only understand so many interacting forces and because it allows us to isolate a probable cause which we can then research further. So for example, if we find that um, uh, indeed, Lyme is increasing because deer populations are increasing. Now we can develop another hypothesis. We can hypothesize that deer are increasing because there are no um, large predators. And so more deer means more ticks, means more Lyme disease. Or we might be able to hypothesize a different alternative, which we could investigate at the same time, and that is that there is more food for deer, and so more food, more deer, more ticks, more lime. Okay, let's think about models a little bit. Because models, um, they get a bad rap uh, in the popular literature, sometimes even among scientists. Models are just like when you're building a model airplane or a model dollhouse. You are creating something that approximates the real world. And you can learn something from that, right? It doesn't mean you're going to know the real world perfectly or be able to explain it. But it does mean that you're going to know more about it than you did before you built that model. All right? And that model can continue to guide you to learn more and more. Science always builds on itself. All right. So a network model could have something like this. So um, if you have preventative maintenance on rigid pavement versus flexible pavement, then in rigid pavement, you would expect um, spall repairs and joint seals to be an issue. And in flexible pavement, you would expect crack sealing and patching to be more frequent. In that case, that's going to lead to more asphalt sealant for either patching or joint seals, whereas if it's just joint seals that are the most important component of preventative maintenance, then you'd have silicon seal. Um, all right, this is going to seem like a little bit of a leap. This is the standard. You can think of this as the standard. A lot of people get fearful when they see a, a equation. Um, but I just want you to slow down and remember you got this, okay? Because if you have math fear, that's just a thought. It's not necessarily reality. Fear is really a thought. And it has as much substance as um, a wind through the trees, okay? So it's, it, it doesn't define you. Don't let it define you. This is a classic model, and it is a model for understanding the rate of growth of a population. So R, this is easy, it's the rate of the natural increase. So no, nothing is forcing an increase. It's just based on the habitat and resources, the quality and quantity available, you get this natural increase of the population size. N is the number of individuals in that population of, in the area that we're considering. So R times N, is going to give you a number. It's going to give you a value, right? Um, 
And since r is a rate, it's going to be between 0 and 1. And so it's always going, so if you have a number of 100, then that rate of go, growth will be a portion of 100, so to speak. Um, T is some stated interval of time. Okay, so that time could be defined by generation time. So if uh, we're looking at flies that have three generation times in a season, then that might be our T. Or we could be looking at two years of flies and their three generation times, which would make it a different T. You can imagine if we had elephants and we were considering generation time, that T is going to have a different value. Or maybe we just want to know what's happening over the next decade, okay? And then that would define T. So this is N, the number of a population at any given point in time. And this is how it's changing based on the number of births and the number of deaths. The rate is going to change based on how much is coming in to the population, birth and immigration, and how much is leaving the population, death and emigration. So our null hypothesis example, fish correctly perceive the quality of their lake habitat and choose the best environment. So based on this prediction, the highest quality and quantity of food will be correlated with the highest reproduction in that area for that species. And this is then we do a patch comparison, right? Because we expect the highest quality and quantity of food found in one lake habitat will be compared to another area, lake habitat, in which that quality and quantity of food is not as good. All right, I want to skip ideal um, I want to skip ideal free distribution today. Um, so we're running out of time anyway. Okay. Just to reiterate how patch size and habitat can be defined by the organism in which we're looking at. So a flower is a resource patch for pollinators. And we can define patches among that flower or within that flower that would be better. So is the patch that is the sepal or tepal or whatever this is here better than the this patch of pollen that's five days old versus this patch of pollen that's two days old? All right. Now we talked earlier about how populations can change in size because of immigration and emigration. I mentioned this idea of source sink populations. Source populations are going to have more emigration. So they're usually large populations, they have a lot of density, and so organisms, birds, people, uh, mice, are going to want to move out of that dense population where resources are becoming more and more limited to a new population that doesn't have as high a density, and so there's either more resources and or better quality resources. A sink population is where the immigrants are going to. So if you have a population of um, human beings that are living on the coast that's being exposed to increasing hurricanes and increasingly strong hurricanes, then they are going to become a source population and they are going to sink into that inner part of the U.S. where they're not going to be exposed to that hurricane and loss of destruction of their resources in that um, new habitat. There is intrinsic habitat quality. So this is intrinsic instead of external to the habitat. It's not quality that's defined by what's happening around or outside the habitat, but it's defined by the habitat's resources itself and the potential resources that it can offer. So what resources would a maple forest offer the nuthatch? What intrinsic resources would a maple forest offer the nuthatch? Well, it would offer it a place to hide its insects, find insects for food, um, utilize big leaves for nesting. All right, so there's also the concept of realized and apparent quality, actual resources a species can get from the habitat. So realized versus apparent, all right? I'm just see if we have any. 
I think we're going to skip survivorship curves too. We'll get to survivorship curves next. So a realized versus an apparent quality is these are the resources that are actually um, the individual nut hatch is able to get. There could be, let's say, it's a the maple forest has suddenly lost its uh, there's a fire or there was a huge ice storm and the population reduced in size by half. So now you've got intense competition compared to the previous years between those nut hatches. And so there's an apparent quality. The habitat still has a lot of, appears to have a lot of resources available to those nut hatches, but there's only a few of the nut hatches that are going to be able to actually realize the resources that exist or remain within that habitat. All right, so we're skipping that pipe, and we're going to skip survivorship curves. All right, so if you have any questions, um, we will start up with some of these other concepts in population ecology in the next class. Always contact me if you have questions. You can reach out to me at my email um, and or my website, which are both visible on my YouTube channel. Thanks a lot.